So let us listen now to Michael Wallner speaking about compacted binary trees, which admit uh, stretched exponentials. Thank you very much, Elena. And thank you very much, first of all, to Kasha and Noam for this very nice conference. I think it works so far very well, and I'm really enjoying the conference here. And I also want to thank you, the re referees of um, the small extended, the small abstract. I'll try to be, uh, I get, they gave me some ex nice advice what to do, and I'll hope to, I'll try to be not too technical. I'll try to and introduce everything thoroughly. And then at the end, I'll show you um, what kind of extensions we can have. But then my third thank you actually goes to one to one actually as well, because right now I can go a bit faster and go to the interesting combinatorics. And I'll show you now how we got the result Antoine mentioned and what we can do. So if you have questions, please feel free um, to ask anytime. And I'm happy to discuss now or later. Okay, first of all, let's start light. What is a compacted binary tree? Well, really simple start, binary trees, we all know them. I'll denote by circles, internal nodes. I'll denote leaves by uh, squares, they have out degree zero. They will all be rooted and in the same, same as for the case for Antoine, they will be plain, so they are the left and right order of the children. And how we can construct them easily, recursively, a binary tree is either a leaf or it consists of a root and the left and the right binary tree. So let's now, why are they nice? What can we do with them? For example, one of the nice uh, use cases is they can use to store arithmetic expressions, like for example, this arithmetic expression here, x squared minus y squared times x squared plus y squared. How can they do that? Well, we all know, we just put that, that um, we label the nodes, and then this corresponds basically to this uh, arithmetic expression. But here we lose a lot of, um, um, storage, if you want to have all that in, for example, your favorite uh, computer algebra system, then they won't store it like this binary tree, but they use a compaction procedure like the one um, Antoine introduced. Just let me go through. I use more or less, I use the same idea. Basically, we go through post order. So we start here with the leaf, and every time we see a new um, element, we remember it, we give it a unique name, and we remember the root and its children with the ID. So this one gets now ID one, because the first time we see X zero zero. Then in post order, we go on, ah, we see it again. We don't need to store it. We just remember there's a one. Then we go on, ah, we, we see something new. We see a times, and this is a new element. We give it ID two. And then on the left, we have a node at a subtree, which has ID one and ID one. So that's what we save here. And that's how we go on in post order. Basically the next one is here. We see a new element and so on. Like this, what we create, we create a list of elements which uniquely decomposes our tree into its unique subtrees. The unique subtrees are how here in gray, if you can see them, and the ones which are repeated are in white. So this one has here seven unique subtrees. And then the representation I'm using, and that's the one we know already from the previous talk, is like in form of a DAG, in form of a directed acyclic graph, where instead of um, keeping these elements, we just put pointers to the first occurrence in post order. So this was here, the first time we saw the X, the first time we saw the Y, well, and so on, the first time we see this. And then we are interested in this object, and that's for me a compacted tree here, just a compacted binary tree computed by this procedure, like we have seen before. So compacted trees, what is important for these elements? Um, it's very important that the subtrees are unique. That's why we look at them. That's why they are so efficient in storage. Then I've just shown you this efficient algorithm. So this is now the second time you see it. Now you should be an expert on this algorithm. This is a nice take home message. If you, if you remember only this one, that's very nice already. I'm very happy. So here it has been shown that in expected time, risk, uh, linear expected time, we can compute the compacted form of a binary tree. Then it started here, the analysis here using analytic combinatorics started from, um, with Flasher, Lacey, Pal, and Stayat in the 90s, where they've shown that if you take a, a tree of size n, it has compacted form of expected size n divided by square root log n, where the constant is explicit depending on your model, depending on the uh, labels of the nodes and so on. So what that means, well, you win a lot. You win a square root log n. So for large n, you really, well, it doesn't look like too much, but well, it's, um, uh, it's, not, it's definitely not of the same scale. Where does this appear? Well, it not, we didn't make it up. It appears in XML expressions, in compilers. It's known as the common sub-expression problem. It's used in, the, uh, in Lisp as a data storage and so on. And now we come to the problem of this talk, or one of the problems, because it's the first discrete object. We ask the reverse question. 
how many compact trees of compacted size n exist. Compacted size I define as the number of um, internal nodes. And we simplify everything even more. We don't care about labels. It's complicated enough. We just look at uh, unlabeled binary trees. And here is the main result. And here is the thing, the last thing I promised. Now you know what a compacted tree is. And the next thing in the title I haven't introduced so far is a stretched exponential. And a stretched exponential is such a term. And base to the n to some sigma. And here we have shown, um, together with Andrew and Vengie, um, that the number of compacted binary trees of size n behaves asymptotically like n factorial 4 to the n times this stretched exponential. So we see an e to the 3 a1 n to the 1 on 3 times a polynomial term n to the 3 on 4. And what's quite nice, this stretched exponential is completely explicit. So what we see in here is a1, which is the largest root of the famous Airy function, which is just here an integral representation. I will talk more about the Airy function a little bit later. And what we conjecture on numerical experiments is that Actually, this is not only a theta result, but actually they, sh they should also hold an asymptotic equivalence with the constants which we can uh, compute to very accurately, very, very accurately, but our method does not give the constant. So, so far we can only prove that there is a constant such that it's upper bounded and lower bounded by this complexity class. Okay, so this is the first main result on compacted trees. And then I want to go a little bit more in the, uh, in the sense of the, um, and as many computer scientists, we use this result as well, or we adapted this method to count deterministic finite automata. So let me start as well, what is a deterministic finite automata? And the reviewers asked me, especially interested in this part, so I decided to introduce DFAs as well, show how they work, and show how our method applies to this result. So a DFA, I'm sure most all of you know what it is, but just a short recap on a binary alphabet A, B. So it's a graph. Here you see an example. We have two outgoing edges from each node, which is called state, which are called labeled A and B. Then we have an initial state. Well, here I labeled it, it's Q0. It will always be Q0. This is the initial state, which is, acts kind of as the root. And we have some final states. They are colored here in green. These two are final states. Then such a DFA um, basically uh, gives you as well, it defines a language. It, and the language is the set of accepted words. So how does it work? If you have a word in a two-letter alphabet, A, B, you start at the beginning and you see, for example, an A, then you could go onto the path of, on, uh, to, oh, I'm sorry, to, to uh, traverse the path at the edge, which is labeled A. Then you're in state Q1. And then you go on. And you, every word which ends then in an accepting state is called an accepted word. And the, num the set of accepted words is the, la is the, la is the language it defines. So in this case, we have the accepted words A, because we can traverse here, we have AA, we have BA, and we have ABA. And now it's called minimal if there is no DFA with fewer stage that accepts the same language. So here, this one is the minimal uh, DFA. So if you're bored, you can think, you can try to prove that this is really minimal for this language here, basically. And what is important here, um, that it's acyclic, meaning that there's no cycles except at the loops here for this DFA. And this is uh, for a finite language. This will be always the case. So counting minimal acyclic DFAs, that's what we're interested here in, um, has been work, uh, well, people, a couple of people has, have already worked on that. But the asymptotic number of the minimal number of acyclic DFAs with, on a binary alphabet, I denote by MN, uh, was so far unknown. So people, uh, it has been started, uh, people worked on it, Domanatsky, Kisman, Charlie, and Liskowitz started, uh, uh, were quite interested in between 2002 and 2006, but the best bounds were so far known uh, off by an exponential factor. So the previous work were on the compacted trees, uh, and we, ha we studied the related structure, which we call relaxed trees, give you up and lower bounds, and they already give you that, okay, there has to be a stretched exponential in there, explaining a bit why it's complicated to count them. And these were off by a polynomial factor n to the one on four. But now I'm, I'm, I'll now show you how we can use our method in order to get the main result here. And we show that the stretched exponential appears here again. And now the polynomial factor is n to the seven on eight. Um, we see again 
the n factorial, we see an exponential growth of a to the n. All that makes sense because we have binary and then we have for every state the possibility to be accepting or not. So this gives you a two to the three, the eight. We see the same stretched exponential. This is a bit mysterious and I'll motivate why it appears afterwards. And we see explicitly as well the polynomial term. But again, um, we can conjecture the, co the constants which should be in front or which we conjecture is in front, but we cannot prove that this holds asymp asymptotic equivalence, but we can compute it with a very high precision. So again, this is a theta result, meaning we, have, we can compute an upper uh, constant, which constant time this is bigger than this and constant time this is smaller than that. Okay, so this is now the introduction of the, of the two uh, discrete objects we're looking at. And now let's go a bit into the detail. So what is the area function? Why does it appear and what's it doing here? So the area function is a very classical function in um, physics, theoretical physics, but also of course in mathematics. It's defined, it has an integral representation like that. Um, but what I prefer and what we will see and what it's, it's defining is a differential equation. So it, the area function satisfies this differential equation. So the second derivative of the area function is equal times x times ai times, um, well, x times the area function. And this will be the reason, well, this is the correct, this times and boundary constraints, well, this gives you two solutions, and the one which goes to zero for infinity, for x to infinity, is the area function, which ai, which we call the ai. We don't, we will not need, we will not see the, the second solution, the second uh, of this differential equation. Then the large root, here you see a plot, is at my, which you could denote by a1 is happens at minus 2.3838 and this will appear in the stretch exponential so just a few side remarks in combinatorial analysis where it has appeared before it has appeared for example in random maps or in the area in the brownian excursion area that's just through some side remarks so let's start do some combinatorics and that's the bijection to the decorated path um, um, antoine mentioned on the previous um, in the previous talk, now it's very nice. I can make this now explicit. Okay, let's start. We take a compacted, uh, no, a DFA. So let's take this DFA. So the first thing we basically do, we have again in green accepting states and white non-accepting states. What we do, first of all, we highlight a spanning tree by a depth first search um, um, traversal. We don't care about the sink. Note that we think um, that all our results are for uh, DFA uh, language is recognizing, uh, DFA is recognizing a finite language, meaning that the, 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 the unique sync will never be an accepting state. So basically here, what we do, we don't care uh, about the sync and we go depth first and we get a spanning tree. This is now shown in black. Then we color the other objects in red, the other nodes, the other edges in red. And then we draw it as a binary tree because we interpret as Antoine, like the true or false, we interpret like he did true left and false right. And I just take A left and B right, uh, B right. And then we get a plain binary tree. And that now looks already very much like um, the DAX I've shown you before of the compacted binary trees. What we do next, we label the nodes in post order again post order, like in the compaction procedure, and we label them as we see them. We see this one first, then we see this one, this is the third one we see, the fourth one, and so on. By this really? construction. Uh, Mikhail? Yes? You are doing projection uh, from compacted binary tree? I'm doing now DFA the label. to a, D, no, 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 I'm doing DFA to a compacted structure, and then this is, if you want, this is an intermediate auxiliary structure, and now, and then I'll, my goal is a path uh, decorated path structure, decorated dig struct, dig path structure. Because you also had like labels saying we correspond to left child and right yes. child. In this yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. So exactly here I had A, B, A left, B right. Like this, I have the left, right order on the children. That's why I can forget it now. That's why I don't care about it anymore. And then what we do, we just forget about the labels. So here they were here, but of course we can also just remember, sorry, I have to, I shouldn't point on my screen. Um, we can we only have to remember the um, the where it's pointing. Okay, so this is now my structure here, and now I'll show you how we get a decorated path structure from this. So basically, what we do then, well, we traverse the tree, of course, again. We go along the contour of the tree, and what we do, we start here at minus one zero for technical reasons, and then every time we go through a pointer, a red pointer. What we do, we go to the right. 
and we add we mark make a x into the box into a box which is below and here we see numbers from one two three four five six and these numbers correspond to the pointers the nodes they are pointing to so we make a cross here and we go to the right then we go through two um, red edges again so we go to the right we go to the right and we make a cross in the in, in the deck in the path in the box below um, which corresponds to the one and every time we go up every time we go up um, an, a black edge base, uh, basically what we do um, we go we, we also do an up step here and we label according because every up every, every of these black edges corresponds as well is uniquely can be uniquely associated to an internal node we also color it according to this node here this is basically the two here and then we go on we see it, we go up again so we go up this is number three it corresponds to three here as well and you see it's colored with a white uh, a node with a white uh, color because this was a non-accepting state and that's how we go on we go on in here blah 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 and basically what we get we get here then this structure here we get here this is a bijection from um our dfas and now this intermediate compacted structure to some kind of dick paths which marked boxes okay so what how do these paths look like okay these paths are actually what we're going to analyze so these paths are start at minus one zero and they end at nn then furthermore they always stay below the diagonal here and what happened after the first step i mean this is a technical step and then furthermore one box is always marked below each horizontal step so basically what i've shown here when we do a horizontal step here for example we have one possibility if we do a horizontal step here we have two possibilities because there would be two boxes and so on so basically this corresponds to the weight of a right jump so the, the weight of the jump depends on its height and if we do a vertical step then we always have two possibilities it's either green or white so every up step has just weight two which i see which i call it here by which i gave you a name two. so every up steps gets a weight two so basically we live in this lattice and we look at paths which live in this lattice and by the bijection the number of these paths is the number of my acyclic acyclic dfas so basically what i'm then interested in is just these paths and well these paths are not so hard to come up with a recurrence release so let's say call a and m the number of paths ending at nm Okay, at the end we want to end at nn. Then a and m is basically what is it? It can jump from, from here. You can jump from below. So this is n m minus one, and we have two possibilities, weight two. Or if we want to jump to the right, then it's a right jump. So it's n minus one from n minus one m. It comes from the left, and it the, 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 the number of possibilities depends on my current altitude m. So if I'm at two here, basically, then I have three possibilities, which we see here. All on this one, we have three possibilities. And this gives you here this recurrence relation. And we're interested in the number of paths ending here. This is now these paths, but minimality. Minimality has not been taken into account. Minimality is not hard to grasp. It's just, it's a bit technical, but basically what happens for minimality is we just have to be careful for leaves in my path construction. So basically Antoine introduced the word spine. The spine is here, everything, this, this, this trees. The spanning tree is basically the spine. And in this spine, there is some leaves. For example, this one here, the one which is with number four. I'm sorry, I'm jumping up and down. So we are not minimal. So this may be a bit fast. In here, if we copy, if this object here copies something, reproduces something we have seen already before. For example, this is not allowed. For example, now I've changed here the three into a one because this four now just copies basically what happens here. This is this node here is now exactly the same as this node here. And what what we can show is that the number of possibilities here depends just on the previous um, nodes we have seen in post order. Again, like Antoine in Antoine's case. It's the same. We don't care what happened before, just how much things happened before, how many trees happened before, because we can copy each of these trees basically by a certain configuration here on the labels. This is now a bit technical, maybe, but basically it just means if in our in our in our where am I in our 
uh, path bijection, what's happening? Well, we just have to be careful for some objects which are like leaves. And this leaf here is a, a, a red edge, red edge and up. It basically corresponds to a right, right up. All these objects here, I have to be careful. And here, some of the possible crosses are not allowed. And how many are not allowed? Well, it's quite easy. M of them are not allowed. Oh, that was maybe too fast. M of them are not allowed because if I'm at altitude M, like if I'm basically um, oh, M plus one, pardon. If I'm already here, I have seen uh, I'm at altitude three. I have already seen one, two, three nodes uh, in before, which correspond to unique subtrees, which I'm not allowed to recreate. So just to recap, this just means that I have to subtract a certain term, which corresponds to a right, right up. So from here, if I'm at this possibility, I'm not allowed to do M configurations, which correspond to the unique subtrees. So I know on slides, this is not easy to grasp, but basically what it means, this is my new recurrence relation. And this new recurrence relation is like basic, it is invited, so the objects counted here, which are the object paths ending at NN, correspond to the paths ending uh, to the minimal DFAs we're counting. Okay. Can you so, recall the meaning of the green vertices? The green vertices are accepting states. Accepting ah, states. Okay. So you can yeah. add any subset of them. Yes, yes, yes. As long as I don't copy a new one, I can, I can color them green or white. But basically, we just want to look at these things. And basically, this is my paths. And in these paths, a first simplification is okay. Let's say let's 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 transform it a bit to make it a bit easier. So we divide, we divide by n factorial. This basically what it will do because we have here always the one two one two three one two three four five. The weight of a path is the product of its weights. So we get rid of these. Well, not get we don't get rid of it, but we rescale and we divide by two to the m because if we go up, we always will collect m up steps if we reach this point. And then we do a certain shift here, which I just demonstrate here in a second. So first step is this factor here changes the grids into we get rid of the green ones. The green ones are just now weight one. And we rescale here to have weights which are between uh, zero and one. This will help the next analysis. And then the final step is like we change the order. And this basically just flips the grid. So basically you can think of we started here, we start here and we go now through a tick-like path. We always stay above the x-axis, we end here, and we have certain weights. And then this transforms the recurrence into this. Not again important how it looks like. We can, you, can, you just have to use this transformation to do it. But the idea is now that we have this path structure and the advantage of this one is that n increases in each step. Meaning every step brings us further to the right. Now we have a one-dimensional path structure which is which funny weights. And the interesting thing here is that the weights get smaller, the higher we get. So one is for the jump, for the up jumps here. Here we have one half, two thirds, whatever. The higher we get, the smaller the weights. And this is now what I want to use in order to give an intuition why the stretched exponential appears. And for this, I'll talk quickly about, in a side note, about push stick paths. A simple family, well, not so simple, but a nice family, which is very much related to our objects. So it's this, so let's take a tick path of length n, a path staying always above the x-axis and just doing a one, one or one minus one. So up, north, uh, east or southeast steps. And if a path reaches height h, we give it a weight two to the minus h. So the higher it gets, the less weight we give him. So we want to, 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 to punish him if he goes too high up. And then something happens, something nice. So let's consider paths with maximal height n to the alpha. So here at h, uh, let's say it's n to the alpha. Then it's, well, there, it's, well, it's known as results that the number of paths, the total number of these paths is roughly four to the n times e to the n constant times n to the minus two alpha. This is the total number of paths. This is a known result. Then my weight is two to the minus h, where my h, this is the path which can't go higher than n to the alpha, basically it will reach n to the alpha, is two to the minus n alpha, which I can rewrite again into this form e to the minus log n alpha. At the total number of paths um, ending having a weight n to the alpha is not just a product. So this is basically uh, the mass of paths of ending at uh, of height n alpha if I give him this weight as well. So it's this product. And now we see something very interesting happening. We have here this, exp this, this term and you have here n to the one minus two alpha and n to the alpha. So the high alpha gets, 
the smaller this uh, the, the the smaller this one gets, and the bigger this one gets. So we have the path want to go up because we have more paths if we have tall paths. But if we have tall paths, if high tall paths, then they are pushed down again. So two phenomena push against each other. And this case, the maximum occurs exactly at alpha one on three. Well, this is just where is the maximum of this thing. Um, and this gives you, this is the reason for the stretched exponential here. So we push these two forces, basically, they have an equilibrium, basically, the most mass is concentrated then here. And it's a very similar in our case. So let's do a bit heuristic. Let's show big numbers, which um, where things happen. So what we're interested in was this E and M. So let's plot some of these numbers here, basically. So what I show here is the sequence I've shown before for um, large N and several, M, several Ms. So uh, length 100 on the left and length 1000 on the right. So we see a similar picture as Antoine showed before. So some peanuts happening here um, and other stuff here. And it's very big as well, like in Antoine's face. And what we want to do, okay, we are actually interested in here for paths with m equals zero. So we want to, them to come back to the x-axis again. Okay, so let's zoom in a bit onto the left part here. So if we zoom in, we see something happening. Now I'm zooming to the left part and let's make it a bit bigger, the n, let n equals 2000. And this thing seems to converge to something. Well, we can already guess to what is it converging. And now the idea behind this is that I want to show you how we kind of found that it's actually the area function. So what we guess first is, well, we see here a very large scale on the y-axis. So the first thing we do, okay, there, there is an, it seems like there is an independent factor of, of the amplitude. So the amplitude is dominant, it depends just on the same length n. And then what there is another function, which is this limit scale, um, which depends on m and is rescaled by some function g um, depending on the scale. And here we guess again, so we guess this structure and we guess that it's n to the one on three. And this basically, um, we, this is motivated by this fact that here we have very large scales which depend basically on n. And here, interesting things happen if, we're if we have m close to n to the one on three. And what we do then, we use this in the recurrence I showed you. And then after some technical steps, what do you do? You plug it in, you look, we looked at the quotient, and what we see here is this shape. So we, the quotient h n over h n minus one, if this is true, then this has to be true. It behaves like two times some derivatives of f, where what I've done now, I've rescaled m as well in the scale of n to the one on three so that I zoom into this part. And kappa is just a constant in front of n to the one on three. And if we assume now equal, equal, equality here, because everything is not correct here, assuming that this is the asymptotic expansion of this quotient, we get basically that Hn has this shape with a stretched exponential in the C here, and that the second derivative behaves like this. And this should look familiar. The second derivative is something times k, kappa times the function itself. And this is just a shifted area function. This is just heuristic, but this is our motivation for the area function showing up in here because in the, it's dominating these asymptotics. And then boundary conditions tell you that the C should be actually um, the root of the area function. Okay, stop with technical parts because I don't want to bore you too much. So the inductive proof is now very basic. Basically we use these ideas and what we do, we find upper and lower bounds, which where the area function is hidden in it and where you use the previous heuristics as a guiding um, theme in order to get ideas what's happening and then we, we fiddle as long with these things until we have suitable upper and lower bounds and do an inductive proof on n and m. All this is technical. I won't, don't want to hide it. Who is interested, I'm happy to discuss with it afterwards or uh, we refer to our papers and we discuss afterwards. But what we show is that this holds here um, asymptotically and a and k and b and k, they, they, they satisfy the asymptotics, both the same asymptotics, just a different constant. And this brings me basically to the end. So what I've shown you today is a first a bijection to decorated paths. This is the one I have been mentioned before. Then these ones are easy to analyze by a recurrence relation. Then we showed you some heuristic analysis of this recurrence relation showing the appearance of an area, for an, of an area um, function. And afterwards, which I omitted here was the inductive proof. And here what we get is a lower bound and an upper bound with the same, um, um, behavior, asymptotic behavior, only the constant is unfortunately different and 
you cannot grasp it unfortunately with this method. So this gives you basically the asymptotics for deterministic minimal, minimal deterministic finite automata recognizing a finite binary language and compacted binary trees, which was the first start of this uh, work. So further problems, what I've mentioned previously, multiplicative contents, we don't even know if it exists, could fluctuate, we don't know. Then of course, it's interesting now to start that we have a handle on this object, some statistics. Number of words in minimal, uh, in these languages, what is, what is the length of the longest word in minimal uh, languages and so on and such stuff. And then of course, we're always interested to apply our stuff to other problems like the one from um, um, Antoine. It looks very uh, promising and very interesting, very tempting. Uh, but and it has already, I have to mention that it has already applied to another problem coming from biology. We're counting the number of tree child number networks in phylogenomics. So if you have another tricky recurrence re relation to try, please let us know. We are happy and we, I'm, I'm happy to discuss. We're happy to discuss that. One was already suggested by the referees, which, uh, we can, which is not a language which is uh, uh, finite anymore, but close to finite. It's called piecewise testable. And this looks very interesting, very promising. And we think well, actually we should be able to get some results on that. And all that looks very promising. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Michaela. We have time for questions. Yeah, I have, I have a question. question. Sure. Um, maybe, Sergey, you're first. Um, yeah, I didn't really understand well, but um, the DFA were rooted or not because you Yes. In the decomposition, you, so these are rooted DFA or? The trees were rooted. The DFAs have an initial state. So it kind of gives you a root. Ah, so you start from one initial state and then? then exactly, you... exactly. So you always in the DFAs, you have an initial state. And from this one on, you, you, you parse your, your um, whatever you have in there. So basically your words, where is the nicest one or whatever. For example, well, but, I, it's always Q0. Q0 is my initial <clears throat> state. So one of them should be marked as initial state. But you say like uh, automaton recognizing a language uh, from the alphabet with two letters. So do you make some connection with the language resulting in this enumeration or is just the structure itself? Um, I, the question is what do you mean by connection with the language? So every language every language has a minimal DFA. This one DFA is unique. So every, every DFA defines a language, but there might be multiple DFAs defining the same language. And one of them is unique. And this is the minimal one. And we count the minimal ones. So this kind of recount, every automaton we're counting in here has a unique, oh, well, has un every language has a unique minimal one. So we basically counting um, the languages, uh, we, we, we counting minimal, we counting languages. Uh, maybe a finite, a question finite. like, can it be possible that, uh, to the same language there corresponds like two minimal automatons? No. Except, uh, no. Ah, no. Okay. No. So it's kind of a complex. So if you give me a language, you can think of the minimal automaton as a, uh, complexity measure of the language if you want. Kind of the number of states could be a complexity measure for your, a simple one for your, for your language. Because this is a finite, well, this is the thing you need in order to parse your language. And it's the min minimal one. No, but it's, 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 it's a, really it's a one to question. one. Yes. It's a one to one. Oh. Yes. Okay, Sinja, you, you have a question? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mitchell. I am interested in the, your result. And uh, my question is about uh, two different direction of uh, some kind of generalization. Mm -hmm. One is uh, beyond the finite language, mm -hmm. as the sub labor suggested. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, for the finite case, I think the, the minimality is somewhat trivial, and uh, you can encode some minimality condition in your mm -hmm. decorated parse. But the, I think maybe the for example, piecewise testable languages, may, maybe minimality will be a bit more uh, non-trivial. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, and, I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. But well, uh, maybe. But... 
But I think there's possibilities there. It depends where I've quickly looked and for example, piecewise test I'm not an expert on piecewise testable and I've never known about that before. But what I think what could happen there is that we have two states, of course, one accepting and one non-accepting st final state with the loops. Because so far our final state is always non-accepting because otherwise, of course, it would accept stuff. It would accept everything when you ever reach it there. So if it's just this, basically, and of, of course there's technical issues, then I'm pretty sure we can deal with it. Basically, we would have just two sinks in there. And this is, this is doable. Several sinks is not a problem. And we could live with that. So I can easily, I think, encode a class, which is maybe boring. I uh, can create a class of automata or languages which are infinite and which we can analyze. For piecewise testable, I have to go into the details. But I'm optimistic, actually, because it looks like mm -hmm. a simple relaxation. Or just, let's say, the next logical step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And uh, another direction is mm -hmm. uh, ternary alphabet. Alphabet mm -hmm. consists of mm -hmm. more than two letters. Yes. yes. And ma maybe it, so three dimensional dike paths like yes. uh, notion is needed, but okay, D do you know the, the Cyril Nikal result about random yes. deterministic automaton? Yes. Okay, the, his result is that the, if the letter, there are three more letters, then the almost all accessible automaton is actually minimal. Well, well, actually, to be honest, I didn't know this one now, but yes, Okay. Yeah. So my question is, do, do you have any such conjecture about uh, some statistical properties about automaton? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this would be re is a really interesting question. So this is a project I want to go on in the next mm -hmm. uh, next years, let's say. <laughs> next years, okay. Is something interesting. Well, I'm interested in when some stretched exponentials appears uh, in other structures and statistics. I have to be honest, we have not really looked at statistics. We are happy now that we are able to count for ternary alphabets. What we get here, and this is also for ternary compacted trees and all these structures, we don't get the three dimensional paths, but what we can do, we don't have a dig path below a slope one, but we have slope one on three, one on four, one on five, one on six, and so on. And then basically, because it's basically similar to the bijection from ternary trees to kind of a subclass of Lukashevich paths, if you, if you know these ones. And this, this is basically what happens. Basically, we just use different building blocks there. So we don't need to go into dimension three. So also this is doable. And here we have very, there is a dependency. And so far what we think, what we see, but this is just conjecture so far, is that the n to the one on three in the, in the stretched exponential seems universal, whatever universal means. The mm -hmm. constant changes, the area root is there, but it's changes with the constant changes. But the n to the one on three in my final result should still be there. So this is already quite nice. So of course the model has some influence, but but basically it will change something here. It will change stuff here, but this n to the one on three seems to be there in all these cases, mm -hmm. ternary, quaternary, and so on. Okay. But it's ongoing yes, work, you. but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very, yeah, very good questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I will read your paper and I will send a message if please, I yes. have some idea. Please, yes, of course, please, yeah. Please. I, I would like to ask a question, please. Sure, yeah. Yes, uh, you just mentioned the, the class of uh, relaxed uh, compacted trees, so where the unicity of sub substructure is not uh, a constraint anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there uh, also a uh, stretch exponential? Yes. The uh, do I have it here on my slides or not? Uh, no, I didn't put it on my slides, but yes, there is. Um, and the only thing which changes is that the polynomial term. So it's like compacted trees. So everything is the same, but here we have a three over four. Okay. N to the three over four, and we could, could get even more terms. So compacted and relaxed trees are just off by an N to the one on four, polynomial term N to the one on four. And this was our first bounds for the minimal deterministic automata. And they are actually exactly in the middle, if you see. This length one on four yes, interval yes. is just split into the middle. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's even simpler, actually, everything there, because you don't need minimality. And technically, it's much simpler, because the, 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 I have not talked about it, but the minus in the recurrence relation makes really, well, makes it complicated. Because compact relaxed trees don't have a minus, they just have a, re, a, re, a recurrence relation here, which has yes. just 
positive terms, positive coefficients, this term makes technically it really complicated, but for relax, it's actually easy. Yeah, so, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but if you want to, yeah, feel free to, to talk, to, 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 we can discuss this stuff and maybe work together yes, or yes. something. That, because yeah. the, in the context of BDDs, there are also mm -hmm. subclasses where the unicity is not uh, constrained mm -hmm. anymore. And mm -hmm. so, uh, oh, yeah. I think yeah, this, the, this should be, I think this is a good starting point for, for the method then, because yes. this then left, left it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have a yeah. question, if I may. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the approach uh, were, was applicable to other sequences, right? I'm yeah. wondering to what extent. I mean, if I have a, 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 a recurrence relation like this, so mm -hmm. linear with polynomial coefficients and uh, several variables, um, mm -hmm. how is that going to work? I'm, uh, in particular, is the heuristic approach going to be similar or can it be radically different? And uh, is it important that you have only two variables? Yes. Okay, two questions. So, so far, well, all we know with this approach is like that it's a two variable recurrence relation, which is dick like I would say, and not too complicated. And something similar popped up for phylogenetic trees, for example. The, 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 well, the, if the slides are online, you can click on everything on the link and then you see uh, the, the papers or you just Google. Um, so yes, it was important that it's a two variable recurrence relation. And actually we used a lot the guiding principle from the push stick path for an intuition. And this is what happens for more variables, things get messy, I guess. I don't know. I don't even dare to say, to, 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 to think about what, what, happening, what happens there. So far, it's like we have here, Basically, if you look at this, we have here weight one for an, um, if I'm, I'm always mistaken, an down step and something like if you, if you can think of this as one minus two over n, well, one over two over n plus n, something like-ish. And this here is a weight which is close to one. So we have a weight one and a weight which is close to one. And this is somehow the balance coming as well from high I go, the more it pushes it down okay. and so on. And this actually, let's say it's nearly negligible in a sense for the SM logics. It's actually, so this is just makes things just complicated. So the basic structure we are looking at at the moment is a bivariate stuff, which is like thick like and where we have a weight in front of one of the objects, which is nearly the other one, but depends on the height. And this is, is actually just the reason for the, for the phenomenon of a stretched exponential, which is quite amazing. And I guess if you have a slightly different uh, relation, you will have something different uh, from the area function or is it somehow a universal? Good question. I don't know. Okay. Yes, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you. Uh, if I may, I would, um, I would say that it's that's not really, um, it's not limited to the every function. In fact, it depends on the recurrence that we have. For different recurrences, maybe we'll have functions that are governed by other differential equations, I think. Okay. So, okay, I see the stretch exponential comes from these types of uh, recurrence, but the, the, the details uh, give you a different uh, differential equations. Exactly. So okay. I, I had to drop here these proofs, but oh, well, these connections here, it's in our paper, but basically this is the, like dick-like. And if you change things here and so on, you get, let's say, other derivatives as well, if you want, for example, third, whatever. And this, this is the defining thing here for ARI. Okay. Heuristically, of course, but well, you can prove it. And this depends on the recurrence. And if you change the recurrence slightly, you change this part here as well. Okay, so this, this is nice that you decorated the, the, two, the two aspects. Mm -hmm. So, so <clears throat> you have a question. Mm -hmm. um, just, uh, yes, uh, some, some question. So, so um, in fact, you have a, a, a bivariate holonomic expression. So it's a, a DPE uh, equation that uh, follows uh, E and M. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 um, you, can, you, you, you can use bivariate uh, uh, function to, to represent E and M. And uh, what you have is a, is a holonomic expression. Yes. Two variables. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, so for instance, you put a uh, sum of uh, e and m uh, times uh, z to the n times uh, y to the m. Mm -hmm. And uh, your your expression explains that you have a, a holonomic. Uh, this this equation is holonomic. It's uh, 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 
do you try to 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 get the asymptotics directly from 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 the from the functional equation? Yes, I, yes, I did that before using this approach, and okay. because you binding n and m, it, we, I couldn't, I wouldn't, I didn't get too far. I have to be honest. So it did not work. So I didn't, I didn't get it because of the interplay between n and m. I see what you mean. I had some functional equations, some representations, and so on. Um, but things here get messy. I had, I, I can give you a PDE here, but I can, I didn't get anything out of the PDE. Okay. I, maybe it's a possibility to get the constant. Of course, I agree. But so far, we were not successful to get it. So I, we could write it down, but it's complicated. It's, not, it's actually not so complicated, but it's, well, yeah. in a sense, we had the feeling that it hides this interplay between weights and height, which we had to separate in order to get this sphere, which is basically here hidden in this box, which is in here, basically. Yeah, and for, for the other, for the, for the PDE, I didn't see how to get it. I had some discussions on it a bit with Shen Kuei and well, <laughs> it's yeah, not easy. <laughs> because for instance, when Shen Kuei analyze uh, Stirling numbers, mm -hmm. Uh, typically, we have the, the same type of, uh, of differential uh, uh, DPE equations. And okay, so <clears throat> and, and, and the, you, you, there is some Stokes phenomena uh, uh, that explains the, the m to the one over three. And so I. So you know, it's, it's, it's always, but it's always, it's always a PDE. So I, I never, I'm not able to decouple X, the derivative with respect to one and the other variable. So I call it actually about well, holonomic. It's like if it's a, a, a differential equation in one of, in all variables, like a No, 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 holonomic, um, bivariate holonomic, no, not, not monomic. There's different notions. Well, okay, yeah, that, well, people, different authors use different notions. Uh, I would call it holonomic if it's defined, uh, holonomic in each variable. No, no, no. Yes, not, not only. Well, like, at least I, it doesn't. So we couldn't get far with this notion, with the, with this PDE, and PDEs are complicated. So yeah. Yeah, certainly. No, no. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. I agree. Olivia, yeah. it's a very good. I agree. Yeah, no, no. I tried. Which I tried to play with it for a long time, and well. Well, I think we don't have some uh, powerful tool for PDE mm. that works everywhere, and the one we have looked at is quite intertwined between symbols, so we didn't manage to separate them uh, just no, no, no. directly. So it's yes. just something like that. Uh, I, I agree with you, but uh, sometimes you, you can use some uh, match, match asymptotics approach. So if you have the, you, you, you can expect that you know what, what is the, the behavior of the, of the function uh, and uh, you, you just let the mm, uh, mm. not, not known on just you put it inside the, the, the DPE and uh, you, you try to, to match the, the coefficient to, to, to have the asymptotics. Uh, it's, it's just heuristic, but in general, it works very well. So, uh, 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 can you send us a reference? Because we don't know about this method, apparently. I have no reference because I, I, I do this with Aska very frequently, but uh, I, I know no reference. I think I discussed something like that with Shen Kuei at some point. And the idea is, is, is just uh, try yeah. to, to, to assume what is reasonable to have as a solution. Yeah. But let, let uh, free the, the, some, some, some constant uh, and, and put it inside the, the, the DPE and, and try to, to, to find the value of the, of the constant. It's, uh, yeah. yeah. It's um, to do, for instance, when we have a C series. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is more difficult. Yeah. So, uh, so far, I know just some cases which have been worked out. Uh, and a, a collaborator of Shen Kuei, and he did something like that, I think, for, was it tries? Was it something like that? I can't remember what it was. I don't say this gives a, a, was a, 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 a proof, but. Uh, yeah, no, so maybe, 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 no, I agree. It could give, con it could give access to the constant. This would be okay. one of my hopes. This would be one of my hopes, Olivier, I agree. Okay. It's what I, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I suggest that you continue, that we continue uh, either on Discord 
or during the open problem session. So we can close the, the talk and thank again the speaker. And we can move to 